Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's Academy lecture entitled, You're Doing It All Wrong, How Germans and Americans Misunderstand Each Other While Working to Deal with Climate Change. Uh, I'm delighted that our speaker uh, for this event is Samantha Gross. Samantha is uh, coming to us from uh, California, where um, uh, she is currently traveling, but she is a fellow and director uh, at the Brookings Institution, uh, and she runs the Energy and Security and Climate Initiative. Um, Samantha has just finished several months in Berlin, um, uh, where she was a fellow at the Bosch Academy, and that uh, time has uh, given her a lot of insights uh, into uh, the subject of today's talk. Her work focuses on the intersection of energy, environment, and policy, including climate policy uh, and uh, the international diplomacy surrounding it, energy efficiency, unconventional oil and gas development, uh, regional and global gas trade, and the link between energy and water. Samantha is a prolific author. Um, you can find uh, a huge raft of her papers on the Brookings website. She's published in the New York Times and Politico and China Daily. Um, and she lectures frequently on these, uh, on these subjects. She has about more than 20 years of experience uh, in the field. Before joining Brookings, she had been a visiting fellow at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. She was also director of the Office of International Climate and Clean Energy at the US Department of Energy. Um, tonight, or today, I should say, depending on where you are, she will discuss uh, the renewed efforts towards decarbonizing uh, and uh, how that is going in Germany and in the US uh, since the US has essentially relaunched uh, its um, uh, efforts to mitigate climate change since President Biden's inauguration. And I know she has lots of great insights into how we're working sort toward the same goal, but um, often uh, in very different ways and even across purposes. Let me just give you a, um, a little roadmap for um, uh, the, the program. Um, Samantha is gonna start speaking uh, momentarily um, you can send in your questions. She will speak for about 25 or 30 minutes. Uh, feel free to uh, send your questions into the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. Don't raise your hand. Um, no one will be able to see it. And I will uh, do the best I can in the Q&A period uh, to cover as many questions as possible. And so with that, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Samantha Gross to the American Academy. And um, Samantha, the virtual podium is yours. Thanks so much for your invitation. I really appreciate, appreciate it. And I want to encourage people to send in questions. I can only talk for so long at the little green dot on my laptop camera. And so I'll, when I finish the remarks, I really want to hear back from you and to know that you all are out there and interested. So please send in questions. So I'll start by saying that the US is back in the game in terms of dealing with climate change and it's really not a moment too soon. Seriously, 2021 is an incredibly important year in the global battle against climate change. This is the year that the Paris Agreement's member countries need to come forward with their new updated pledges. How the agreement is set up, this happens every five years with the idea that these pledges will get more ambitious over time as technologies get cheaper and more accepted and also just because of peer pressure from various countries encouraging others to do the same because this is sort of the ultimate tragedy of the commons. We all need to work together to solve this problem and peer pressure is frankly an important component of that. So implementing technologies and applying peer pressure really leads into the subject of my talk today. As Dan said at the beginning, I was in Berlin for the first part of 2021, just until a couple of weeks ago. And I watched the evolution of the Biden administration's policy at the same time that I was having tons of meetings with various people in Germany, people from government, from industry, 
from non-governmental organizations, um, industry groups, academics, and also policymakers from the EU. And as this was going on, I ended up realizing the vast difference in US and German approaches to climate. And this isn't just a project, a product of the Trump years and President Trump's rejection of everything related to climate. This is really a difference in the underlying approach of the two countries and the way the two countries approach environmental problems and the way they feel about different technologies. So I'll open up by talking about the political situation here in the United States. I'll move on to talk a bit about the politics in Germany, and then I'll talk about specific policy differences between the two countries and how they play out both in their implications at home and how they play out in how we work together to solve this really global problem. So President Biden's approach to climate is serious. I don't think anyone here in the States or abroad really doubts his sincerity or the skill of the team that he has put in place throughout the US government. Even at places that we don't typically think of as being particularly involved with climate. The US Treasury is a good example where they are focused on increasing the transparency and the um, the disclosure of climate risks and emissions associated with investments so that investors can make better decisions. This is really a whole of government approach as President Biden likes to say, and I agree with him based on what he's done. But the Republican party in Congress is a roadblock. I saw a survey recently that said that 65% of Americans view the climate situation as a crisis. And that's impressive, that's a strong majority. But the problem is that the other 35% form the base of the Republican party. Republicans in Congress are just not in tune with the majority of the American people or with many businesses. Um, the American Petroleum Institute, a group not known for its lefty policies, recently came out and said that it favors a price on carbon, but Republicans still won't consider it. So, so when the API, the American Petroleum Institute is coming out in favor of, of something and Republicans still won't go there, or you know we're in kind of a strange place. And I hate to make this talk too political, but you can't really have this conversation without talking about the Republican stance on the issue and Republican recalcitrance. So I'll try not to live in the political realm, but you, you can't talk about this without going there a bit. So President Biden, because of Congress, is focusing on actions that he believes he can get through a reluctant Congress, either through regular order or through something called budget reconciliation, where you can pass certain kinds of legislation with only a simple majority in the Senate. Something you won't see is a bill to establish a price on carbon. I was asked that a lot when I was in Germany and the answer was always no. Uh, we simply don't get, don't have the votes to pass such uh, legislation in the United States. The way things stand right now is the American Jobs Plan, which you hear described in the American press as the infrastructure bill that has been under negotiation for about more than two months right now, really is the climate, the, the Biden climate bill. There's not something that's gonna come forward that's gonna be described as the climate legislation because that immediately puts a target on it. So this plan subject to some negotiation includes things like a clean electricity standard to remove carbon emissions from the American electricity sector, funding to build half a million charging stations for electric vehicles, and also rebates and tax incentives to, for consumers to buy those vehicles and programs to retrofit buildings, research clean industrial processes and increase natural carbon sinks like forests. These are all great programs. And the Biden administration has done the math and believes that these things, plus some changes in methane standards that, Cardin, that the Congress has already gotten behind 
and a lot of state and local initiatives that continued during the Trump administration. But these can come together to enable the US to meet its new pledge under this Paris Agreement. That was announced on Earth Day back in April, and it is a 50 to 52% reduction in US greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 based on a 2005 baseline. Um, this is a serious commitment. It's a very serious goal. It will be difficult to do with a recalcit recalcitrant Congress, but we believe that it's possible and that there is a pathway to get there. The political situation in Germany, on the other hand, is completely different. In the United States, Congress is driving ambition backwards. Whereas in Germany, the courts are pushing ambition forward. Just a few weeks ago, the German federal constitutional court dropped an absolute bombshell ruling saying that the existing German climate law did not adequately protect the freedoms of youth and of future generations. The existing law codified the European Union's pledge to the Paris Agreement that requires a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030 off of a 1990 baseline. This is already a very ambitious goal. But the court said that leaving too many emissions reductions efforts until after 2030 left too much of the climate problem to the future, to today's youth and to future generations. So in essence, this relied on a carbon budget theory of how to think about emissions and emissions reductions and said that if, if Germany blew too much of its budget in advance of 2030, that that would not leave enough emissions for the future, enough emissions uh, room in the budget for the future and that that would limit the possibilities of future generations. And I just cannot emphasize enough how, how much of a bombshell this ruling is. It was the first time that we've seen intergenerational equity be cited in a climate related ruling. Um, other things have focused on issues of human rights as in the Netherlands or here in the United States, we are seeing climate related court cases based on the liability of fossil fuel companies for causing climate change, not so much the requirements of government to deal with this problem, to deal with the rights of today's citizens, and then also the inter yeah, intergenerational equity issue involved with future generations. So this is, this is really new ground, and I think, um, people in Germany and also around the world are still sorting out what this means and, 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 and how to move forward in this new paradigm. So now the Merkel government is proposing a 65% reduction by 2030 instead of a 55% reduction. And as I was leaving Berlin and listening to what was happening um, over the past few weeks, I was hearing a lot of revisionist history among politicians with a lot of people saying that they had actually favored a stronger climate law all along. And um, that's not true. There was some fighting within, yeah, exactly. There was some fighting within the leading coalition about the fact that ministers who are governing certain sectors were having to produce more emissions and they were emissions reductions and they would be penalized if they didn't. And so the, the fact that everyone's saying they were in favor of more just isn't quite right. But it's really interesting to see that this race to claim the, the high ground in this election year says a lot about German public opinion on climate action. It's not just the Greens that are pushing for more ambition. This has become largely a mainstream issue in Germany. So Germany has long been a leader on climate action. So this is great. Now there'll just be more of one, right? You know, what's the problem here? Well, this leads into the second issue that I want to focus on in my talk. 
And that is about differences between the two countries and how they play out both in policies and attitudes toward technologies. And why I think these matter, not just for the climate action in both of the two countries, but also for the way that these two countries work together with, the, with how the US works with the EU, and then at how these two countries um, try to lead the world to fix this truly global problem. So let's start with the Americans for a moment. Um, Americans are really fighting climate change with one hand tied behind our back because we cannot establish a price on carbon. We just don't have the votes in Congress to do so. The EU has had its emissions trading system for 15 years and for about, it had some growing pains at the beginning for sure. But over about the last five years, that market has really matured into something that's well-functioning and it has prices high enough to spur action. Last I checked, the European carbon price was about 50 euros a ton, which is significant and enough to really bring about um, action. And honestly, if we could get a carbon price passed here in the United States, even a low price would frankly be helpful. It would give policymakers something to build on in the future, and it would send the signal that having a rising um, carbon price is possible here in the United States. And there's actually a lot of groups that favor it. It's not just the American Petroleum Institute, but a lot of business groups, because it sets certainty around climate policy. It gives them a concrete number that they can make decisions around, and businesses like that. And in Europe, the, Euro, the, the emissions trading system or the ETS as it's often called, is really the cornerstone of the union's climate policy. And the EU is looking to expand it be, beyond the electricity and the industry sectors where it's currently active into the building sector and into the transportation sector. And Germany is ahead of the game and is already doing this. The EU officials also feel strongly that pricing carbon is really central to the global climate policy and the global battle to reduce emissions. And the European Union would really like to see a global carbon price, or at least a carbon price among its wealthy trading partners and in as many countries as possible. Um, you're seeing this as the European Union is working with China, for instance, to establish China's emissions trading policy. So to that end, to encourage others to implement a carbon price, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to protect the competitiveness of European industry, the European Union is preparing something called a carbon border adjustment mechanism. The idea behind this is that the EU will charge its own carbon price to carbon intensive goods that are imported into EU countries as they enter to those who don't face a similar carbon price abroad where they're produced. And this policy on its face sounds really elegant. If you don't have a carbon price at home, we'll charge it as you import it, very simple. But the problem is, is that the details are a real bear. For starters, data is often sparse or in some cases non-existent on the emissions associated with certain products, particularly those made in developing countries. It's also easy to charge this price on goods that sort of come in in a form, are used and stay where they're put. A concrete is a great example. It only comes from a certain number of producers close to the EU because it's expensive to transport. You build something in the EU and it stays where it is. That's a relatively easy place to apply a border adjustment mechanism. But what do you do about goods like cars that contain various raw materials from various places, some of which may have better or worse data on their associated emissions? And the challenge that really faces the EU and the United States, how do you deal with a jurisdiction like the US 
that is quite serious about reducing emissions un under the um, Biden administration, but it doesn't have a carbon price and it's not likely to have a carbon price comparable to that in the EU anytime soon. So the proposal from the EU for this adjustment mechanism is due in mid-July, and then it will have to be approved by the European Parliament and is likely to see some changes and a lot of wrangling along the way to get this done. And I also think this issue of climate and trade and how do we deal with protecting um, greener, less carbon intensive products while still following WTO rules and not getting crosswise with our allies and friends. I think that's likely to come up at the G7 meeting this weekend in the UK. So this is a particular area where the US and Germany are moving in the same directions with result to our overall goals, but we're using very different mechanisms to achieve those goals. And I'm a bit concerned that those may prove problematic. You know, if the EU is focusing on the stick of carbon pricing while the US is focusing on the carrot of subsidizing research and development and deployment of lower carbon technologies, it may be difficult to square that circle. A second area of difference between the United States and Germany is in public acceptance of certain technologies. Just, um, just a few days ago, I heard Gina McCarthy speak and she's the lead White House domestic advisor on climate. And she is, she's wonderful. She's a force of nature, a very practical and pragmatic woman. And she really emphasized the all of the above approach that the Biden administration is taking towards decarbonizing the US economy. She said specifically that she and the administration support running our existing nuclear plants here in the United States as long as they can be operated safely. And she also supports and the administration supports using carbon capture and storage to eliminate emissions that are difficult to eliminate any other way. And this is a real example of American pragmatism coming through in the policy of the Biden administration. There's this understanding that we're in a hurry and that we need to focus on what works. And that's something that I really like about Americans and American policy. On the other hand, when I was in Germany, I heard a very strong focus from all parties, not just very green NGOs, but from the European, from the German steel industry, for instance, on very pure solutions. Renewable electricity and green hydrogen are the acceptable technologies, the ones that German government and industry are pushing for and other technologies like nuclear and like carbon capture and storage are not going to be part of the solution in Germany. And a government needs to be accountable to its citizens. This is a democracy we're talking about. And the German public just doesn't accept these technologies but it does set up a much narrower path for Germany to achieve its own very ambitious goals and that with the recent court decision are becoming even more ambitious. The American public just isn't as anti-nuclear as the German public. And the Fukushima accident convinced even Chancellor Merkel that it was time to shut down nuclear power in Germany. Whereas in the United States, we see nuclear power plants shutting down, but it's primarily for economic reasons for the most part. Nuclear has become more expensive than the constantly falling price of renewable energy and also the very inexpensive natural gas that we produce in the United States. But still, nuclear is about 20% of total US power generation and it's the largest source still of zero carbon power in the United States, even after very rapid growth of renewables. So very different from Germany. In some areas of the United States, we're actually seeing nuclear plants being subsidized to continue operating because this will, will buy us time to increase other forms of low carbon generation. And as long as these plants can still be run safely 
um, American policy is that it makes sense to keep them in order to not increase emissions while we work to replace them with lower carbon electricity, zero carbon renewables. And in the, the talking about carbon capture and storage underground, I really think that decades of experience in oil and gas production here in the United States have made Americans more comfortable with operating in the subsurface. And the idea that carbon capture and storage could be used to save coal poisoned the technology in the eyes of the German public. Whereas we didn't really have that experience here in the United States. It's still um, not acceptable to all, of course, but still much more widely acceptable as a technology that we can use as part of our toolkit and use it to particularly eliminate emissions from areas that are just quite difficult or very expensive to eliminate in any other way. Excuse me. So once again, the democracies have to answer the concerns of their citizens, and I understand why Germany is on the path that it's on. But this combination of extremely ambitious goals and a narrower technological path really sets up a challenge. And I am absolutely not convinced that the general public in Germany understands just how difficult this pathway will be. So as, the, as Germany moves forward, as it works to implement goals that are in line with the 65% reduction goal by 2030, in line with the court case, I think things may get very interesting indeed as the public gains a greater understanding of what that kind of reduction actually looks like on the ground and the kind of um, programs that are needed to get there. So one final difference between the United States and in Germany is in terms of energy security and, and, our, and how we think about energy security in light of an energy transition. And the two countries are in very different places to start. We have to recognize that. The United States is among the world's largest producers of fossil fuels. And any, produce, any solution to the climate issue that does not preserve US energy security and local energy production is gonna be a non-starter politically here. But lucky for us, this should be doable. We have significant renewable resources, different parts in different parts of the country, but this is something that I think we can do. We're concerned about the minerals needed to produce green energy products. Um, but luckily, rare earth minerals actually aren't all that rare. And it's possible to diversify the supply chain in these sorts of minerals. It's something that the world will be working on in the coming years, but it's something that can be done. On the other hand, Germany is more densely populated than much of the United States, and it has always imported fossil fuels. And so this idea of preserving energy security and I hate to use the term energy independence, but it's important here in the US. It's just not an issue in Germany. They've never been an energy independent and Germany doesn't expect to become so now with the energy transition. But renewable energy products, renewable electricity and green hydrogen made from renewable electricity will be a lot more difficult to import than today's oil and gas supply. Electricity itself will have to come in by wire, um, most likely from the very large hydro resources that are present in Northern Europe. Or they can come in as an energy carrier like hydrogen. I heard talk when I was in Germany, I asked a lot, you know, Nord Stream 2 is a, is a perennial issue, um, probably the world's most unfortunate piece of pipe. But I heard a lot of arguments from people that Germany still supported the Nord Stream 2 pipeline designed to carry natural gas from Russia into Germany, because perhaps it could be used to carry hydrogen later. But hydrogen is a lot more difficult to transport than natural gas. It's a much smaller molecule, so you need just a tighter system overall. And it also requires different metallurgy than, the, than a natural gas pipeline. So this idea that you could just flip a switch and bring hydrogen in through the same pipeline is um, somewhat misguided in my point of view. 
So it's understandable that Germany isn't worried about energy imports and energy security, but I think the challenge of importing as much renewable energy and green hydrogen as Germany, Germany expects may be a bit more of a challenge than is expected um, and may be a lot more difficult than importing the more easily moved around oil and gas that form the backbone of the energy system today. So I'll start to wrap it up by saying there are terrific parts of both countries approaches to climate. As an American, I really wish we had the public buy-in on ambitious policy that's present in Germany. The fact that one of the two main political parties here in the United States is still dragging its feet on the need for action is really disturbing. And it's keeping us from enacting policies that could be efficient and effective. And it's also reducing our ability to lead on the global, scale, the global stage. And I, just, I think that's really unfortunate. We're the world's second largest emitter of of greenhouse gases and, and we need to lead on solving the problem. But I also appreciate American pragmatism on this issue. Americans are kind of known for a can do, get it done sort of attitude. And I think it serves us well for this kind of issue where we have a big problem to solve with a lot of different facets and we need to get there in a hurry. Focusing on what we can do and what works is appealing in that um, situation. The German focus on purity and on the very best solutions is really admirable, but it's likely to be a bit of a challenge in a world that is far from perfect, frankly, particularly because you have to work with people like Americans. And so the US could use a dose of, of, European, of European and German ambition and on pushing for the best policies. Well, Germans, I think, could do well to take on some American pragmatism and this focus on, on doing what works. And so I hope that we can see the best in each other's approach going forward and work together in this imperfect world that we find ourselves in and not get crosswise just because we're trying to go to the same destination on different pathways. And so I think for that, I'll, after that, I'll turn it back to Dan and I will look forward to whatever questions you all have. Samantha, thanks for a great uh, and really illuminating talk. I do encourage the audience to start sending in those questions. I have a few of my own to start out with. Um, I think one of the questions that is um, uh, circulating a lot in, in Europe is how much can President Biden do without um, actually having uh, uh, you know, the 60 votes he would need to uh, put a price on carbon. And, um, you know, how, how limited is his room for maneuver if he's um, confined to budget reconciliation and executive orders? Um, can he get uh, from here to where he wants to be um, in terms of the 50 to 52% reduction uh, with the tools at hand? The administration believes that it can. I think it was really important when the US put forward its pledge back in April. It needed to not just be ambitious. Um, there was a general agreement that that pledge, the first digit of that pledge needed to be a five. It needed to be 50% or more. And, and, and that is what we put forward, but it also needed to be credible. Um, talk is cheap. And if we put forward something we, with nothing behind it and no idea how we're going to achieve it. It wasn't going to be credible and wasn't going to get us anywhere. Um, I do agree that it's much more difficult without Congress. The administration believes that it can get many of the things that it wants done, either because some of them are appealing to Republicans. Um, research and development is appealing. Um, electric vehicles may be able to get enough support from Republicans to get through. There are a number of programs that, that, that are widely appealing. Um, and there are some other things that might be possible under budget reconciliation. Um, this is a process for those who don't think about this all day long that is focused. You can pass a bill through the Senate as long as it is focused on revenues and spending. 
And those kinds of things can go through this budget reconciliation process happens once a year and you can get it through with 50 votes. And so there, there's a lot of focus on what can happen through budget reconciliation. And interestingly, the administration, Jennifer Granholm, our energy secretary said this the other day, they believe that they can get a clean electricity standard through the bus, through on the budget reconciliation process. We'll see, but they do believe that that is possible. So the administration thinks they can get a lot done with budget reconciliation. However, it's tough. I mean, it's a narrower pathway. We're using um, some legislation, perhaps not in the way it was intended, we're focusing on doing regulation under existing laws that is certain to end up in the courts because these things always do. Um, and so it would be far easier if we could pass specific climate related um, legislation through Congress. But because we can't, we can do it, but our pathway is more narrow. I think the real question that, that, that sort of falls out of this as well is, should the Europeans and, and others abroad believe us? Are, are, are we credible? I mean, you saw what happened when we went from George W. Bush to Obama to Trump and now back to Biden. And we've just made these hard swings in terms of our climate policy. And an approach that the administration is taking to this is that they're really focused on getting these changes knit into the fabric of society. So they're hard to undo and directionally moving investments in the right direction both private investment by disclosing the emissions associated with investments and the risks associated with the changing climate to move private investment that way. And then also in terms of, of electricity, showing that this is the direction we're going and trying to get enough momentum that it's hard to undo. Um, again, it's not perfect. It'd be better if we had purpose-built legislation, but they are certainly thinking about these things and trying to make them as, as permanent and sticky as they possibly can um, if the political winds change again. Right, makes a lot of sense when you consider, um, you know, all just the, the vulnerability of lots of these executive actions. Um, and we all saw that, uh, you know, much of the Trump administration was devoted to executive orders reversing things that Obama had done. And then the first six months of the new administration has been devoted to undoing those, uh, those yeah. previous undoings. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of an embarrassing uh, comic situation, but... Um, it is, but one comment I'll make on that and I wrote a, a blog post that, that went a long way on this um, about the middle of last year. And that is that the Trump administration really worked to roll back all kinds of things, anything having anything to do with climate. But frankly, they weren't very good at it. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, um, a combination of things, the science was often not on their side and changes in regulation, executive orders are a stroke of a pen, but regulation takes time, public comment and scientific background. And the science was often wasn't on their side and they weren't very good at actually following the procedure that needs to be done. And so um, in some ways it's not great that the administration was not good at operating the levers of government. But in this particular instance, uh, it wasn't such a bad thing because many of the rollbacks that they tried to do, they just weren't successful. They got right. hung up in the courts. Some of them Congress is going back and undoing but um, it wasn't quite as bad as it could have been if they'd been a little better at it. Yeah, it's been, that's been a fascinating development. Um, and of course, um, the Obama team has extraordinary uh, depth of experience in government. So I think they're not gonna make as many uh, of those kind of rookie mistakes that we saw in the last administration. So, um, one question I have for you is, and this is, I think, the perennial European question, uh, is there just the slightest sign of movement on the Republican side towards an acceptance that, you know, climate change is caused by human beings and it needs to be uh, changed by human beings? We did an event, uh, as you know, with Todd Stern, the former 
uh, envoy on, on uh, climate issues during the Obama administration. And uh, I think the next day we saw, and I don't, I'm not assessing uh, cause, cause and effect here, but I, the next day, I think Senator Lindsey Graham said something like, yeah, I think I'm getting to the point where I believe that uh, climate change is a real phenomenon and maybe something we need to worry about or something like that. And it was, you know, is, is that a red time. herring? Is that a red herring or, or are there other minor uh, epiphanies going on uh, in the uh, Republican caucus room? I don't think it's a red herring. I, I think that because public opinion is shifting, um, Republican opinion is shifting as well. Um, particularly among the few, the few moderates remaining in the Republican Party. Um, they're primarily in the Senate just because of the way the House sorts out, the way districts are drawn and gerrymandering. The House tends to be a bit more of an extreme body than the Senate. But there are several, um, there are several moderate senators who understand that climate is a problem um, and that are in favor of some action. Just a few days ago, um, several moderate Republican senators came, said that they could be supportive of a carbon border adjustment mechanism in the United States. And I think they were primarily thinking about keeping out higher carbon goods from China. But still, that, that's a recognition that this is an important issue um, that they need to pay attention to. Um, many moderate Republicans in the House were voted out um, during the, the the 2018 election, the midterm election in the Trump administration. Right. And so that's unfortunate. But um, you're starting to see some movement. But the problem is, is that President, uh, former President Trump still has a really strong hold on the base of the Republican Party. And I think as long as he still has that stranglehold on the activist base, it's going to be hard. And it's hard for moderates, frankly. You saw a lot of moderates either um, you know, really stick their camp, but some of them kind of moved towards the president because that was the, the president at the time because that's the way the right. wind was blowing. So I think as President Trump starts to lose his grip on the party, which I hope happens, you might see more movement on climate. So uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, position of the American Petroli Petroleum Institute, and it might be interesting to uh, open the aperture a little bit there because the big division, uh, you know, in the Republican Party right now, or the one that's opening up, is between the business community and uh, the base. Um, you know, the the MAGA uh, base, as it as it were. Um, and it it seems like uh, there's, uh, particularly by large companies, there's a big appetite for being more appealing to the consumer, more appealing to the general uh, public and more appealing on an international basis because many of these are international companies uh, on climate issues. So that's one of the really big cleavages we're seeing these days, isn't it? I completely agree with you. We saw a real change in the Republican party during the Trump administration from one that was really focused on being pro-business to a party they became a lot more populist. And so this is strange break right now where the pro-business um, party is opposed to something that's really important to many, to many businesses in the United States. Those that have a public face and particularly an international public face have to care about climate. Their consumers care. I told you at the beginning of the talk that 65% of Americans think climate is a crisis and those Americans are consumers. And so, and so yes, I completely agree that the Republican party has gotten away from many of its traditional constituents on this issue. And again, that's an area where that actually makes me hopeful because it gives me, um, it, it gives me hope for movement. And the fact that once we see the, the, the Trumpian um, attitudes lift a little bit, that many natural Republican constituents care about climate, either for moral reasons or for business reasons, and there's no bad reason to do a good thing, so I'm fine with all of it. Um, and, and so that's encouraging. I just think we're in this strange situation right now where the party is out of step and the base is out of step with many natural constituents and long-term constituents of the Republican party. So um, what, uh, what do you think is going to be the story coming out of this um, 
a remarkable series of back-to-back -back summits uh, we're facing uh, on climate. Um, presumably, President Biden has a big job to do to convince uh, his interlocutors that not only is he serious about climate, which I think they accept, but that the United States is serious about climate and is going to get this job done. And so, you know, my question is, what are the signs going to be that he has um, made headway? What kinds of deliverables should we expect? Yeah, I mean, I think he'll use many of the same arguments that, that I have, hopefully more eloquently than I have in his talks with folks in Europe in the coming days. Um, my hope, I have a couple of important hopes for the upcoming summit this weekend, the G7. One of them that would make me very happy is to see a commitment on climate finance in developing countries. Um, I keep talking about this being a tragedy of the commons global problem. And the commitments from many developing and middle income countries, the pledges that they're making to the Paris Agreement are conditional on getting additional financing. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. The idea of this agreement is that all these things come together to be greater than the sum of their parts would have been otherwise. And so it's nothing really wrong with a conditional, um, a conditional pledge but then we in the wealthy world need to deliver. And so I hope to see the G7 come forward and say, we recognize this is an important year. We want to encourage greater ambition among all parties to the Paris Agreement. And we're here to help um, through any number of mechanisms. Everything from the direct aid of groups like USAID or GIZ to working with the multilateral development banks to fund projects to even a lot of projects in developing countries are profitable. They could be decent investments, but they carry a bit too much risk, foreign exchange risk and other kinds of risk. And so if, if the developed world could work to de-risk some of these projects, which might not be very expensive, but could really make a big difference, that's the kind of thing I want to see the G7 countries come forward with because that will be a nice lead in to the G20 coming up in October in Rome, and then on to the Conference of the Parties Agreement of the Paris Agreement that will take place in early November. So that would be a, a good lead in. And I think it would show that the US is on board. I think the US wants to go there. And so that's an area where we could do a ton of good. Um, the other I talked about with respect to the carbon border adjustment mechanism is um, coming together on climate and trade, understanding how we need to protect green industries. We need to make sure that they're not pushed out by less green products. Um, we also need to make sure that industries don't leave areas with more regulation to go to those with less regulation. And so there's a lot to talk about here, but we'll need to come to an understanding that our mechanisms will be different. So I don't think there'll be a final communique that this isn't going to be the be all and all that happens this weekend because European policy isn't even done yet. But um, I would expect to see some language, um, some warm, fuzzy language about um, we are looking at how to incorporate climate policy into trade. We're working together. Um, something warm and fuzzy and supportive of that I also think would be helpful. The, uh, you, you mentioned that a lot of the details have not been fleshed out yet <clears throat> on the carbon adjustment. Uh, <clears throat> it sounds uh, to uh, you know this layman like uh, a great idea that is headed for a world of trouble in the WTO and in trade uh, negotiations. Um, is this is this going to fly? Is this going to work? And Will it require essentially the uh, sort of benign neglect of the of the uh, of the Biden administration to accept it uh, to make it become uh, a thing? And if I can just add one last thing, at a time when the administration is hanging its hat on uh, a foreign policy for the middle class, you know, do those things clash? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, 
I talked to a lot of people um, within the EU and within Germany about the WTO compliance of a border adjustment mechanism. And I'm neither a trade lawyer nor a trade economist, but people tell me that they believe they can do it and make it WTO compliant for the reason that it's an environmental re regulation, not a protectionist regulation, and they think they can get it done. Um, just a quick aside, the kind of, if we were to implement something like that in the United States, it would be much harder to get it to comply with the WTO. Reason being that any price we would apply would be not a direct price that we charge to our own industries because we don't have one of those. It would be more an implicit underlying price um, and regulation and it would be a lot more difficult to get that to fly. So I, the idea is that it can be WTO compliant. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of negotiations on the side not to bring a case and to find a way that to, to get around that. And I expect that that'll be something talked about this weekend. But um, the general opinion from the Europeans is that they can make one that complies with the WTO. And, and broadening out a bit as you did to talk about Biden's um, emphasis on the middle class when you talk about, when you hear a talk about climate policy here in the US, it's jobs, 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 like that's where all the focus is. Um, he, he knows who his base is, that we need a strong economy, that we need to have a just transition that doesn't leave the middle class behind. And he is very, very focused on that. And so I think he understands that. I think he will push very hard for whatever policies we have around climate and trade to preserve the US middle class, um, to make sure the, that we are investing in, in the industries of the future, frankly, keeping those industries in the United States, producing more things here, producing more of the raw materials we, we need like rare earth minerals and lithium and cobalt, finding ways to produce those here and to continue to produce good paying jobs here. But that is his absolute focus and um, he, he, will, he, he will not sign on to anything that doesn't keep that in, in mind. So I, ex, I expect that there'll be some wrangling around this and trying to find a way to square that. Um, just to uh, go back to um, the kind of in, the international uh, climate right now. Um, you know, for a long time, one of the big issues surrounding climate negotiations was the resentment of the developing world at the um, you know presumption of uh, the wealthy countries uh, that they had to uh, bear as much of a burden uh, for this global problem that was largely caused by uh, industrialization in, in the wealthy countries. How has that uh, sentiment, in your view, evolved in the last few years? Has it been in any way mitigated by the outreach that wealthy countries have made, or has it been in any way uh, muted by watching, um, you know, the bloodbath in the United States over, over climate policy and seeing, you know, the possibility that we wouldn't get anywhere on climate uh, because of partisanship? That's a great question. And that really has been one of the greatest stumbling blocks to dealing with climate. Um, the moral argument is that the wealthy world caused this problem and the wealthy world can darn well fix it. And um, morally, that's not a terrible argument, but the issue there is we need, to go to, we need to go to zero in order to deal with this problem. We can't just deal with it in the wealthy world. And also um, OECD countries have flat to declining emissions, whereas the areas where emissions are growing and in some cases growing rapidly is in the developing world. And so we, we can't solve this without the developing world. Um, moral issues aside, practically, it's not possible to do it any other way. Um, the the um, structure of the Paris Agreement was designed to try to get around this problem. Um, unlike Kyoto, where there were um, goals only for, for wealthy countries and not for developing countries. The Paris Agreement is kind of a bring your own goals agreement. Each country pledges what it thinks it can do and those goals get more ambitious over time. 
Um, and that was a way to try to bring everyone on board to get everyone to agree and to try to get away from this us versus them mentality. But it's still there. I mean, it's the reason why you see conditional goals put forward by developing countries. We can do X, but we can do Y if you'll help us out. And I think that's fair. And I'm hoping that greater commitments on finance will help with that because we have to recognize that we, we can't do this without the developing world. And also we have to remember that it isn't just that we need greener zero carbon energy, we need more energy. There are still hundreds of millions of people in the world who don't have access to modern energy services today. And denying that access to those people is not a solution to the climate problem. That's not how we can deal with this. We have to provide modern energy services and clean modern energy services. So what you hope we do is you hear a lot about leapfrogging and in some places that's possible. In, 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 rural, in the rural developing world, a solar system with batteries is an excellent solution to providing um, a decent level of electricity service. And I also think there needs to be a discussion about the degree of environmental degradation that wealthy countries went through on their way to development. It wasn't that long ago that here in the United States, I'm, I'm close to Los Angeles right now, you had air you could chew here. And um, we had rivers in Ohio that were catching on fire. Um, I think we need to emphasize how many environmental problems that we went through and have dealt with in the wealthy world and that countries that are developing today don't have to go there. You don't have to go through this period where you can't see the building across the street because of the air quality. Um, it can't just be sacrifice, sacrifice, have less. It needs to be um, do better. And so it, it's tricky and, and the us versus them and the moral dilemma is very real. But I think with some combination of financing help and also that emphasis that we're not giving you less, we're, giving, we're, we're focusing on giving you better and you not going through this period of environmental degradation on the way. Um, is good, it's good for health, it's good for economy, it's good for development. So um, one uh, viewer um, asks, um, how has the COVID pandemic influenced climate change progress for better or for worse? We know that <clears throat> it was a great year for seeing emissions reductions, but what about the bigger picture over, you know, over the long term? Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, I saw an article in the yeah. paper just over the last couple of days and it, um, and it was like headline news and it was like <clears throat> highest, highest concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere ever. And I have to admit that my reaction to that was, duh. We were, even though the economy slowed down and we emitted less CO2, we still emitted CO2 and it's a, it's a cumulative system. It's like filling a glass full of water. So of course they went up even though we had a pandemic. Um, but the big question for me going forward is twofold. One of them is we saw a lot of behavioral changes during the pandemic and some of them really helped. Mm -hmm. um, I am joining you through Zoom. I did not fly somewhere to do this meeting. I didn't drive to a building to do this. I flipped on my computer and my camera and we're all meeting this way. And that is definitely a lower carbon way to do a gathering like this. Um, how much will travel patterns change, commuting patterns, um, patterns of long distance business travel? That can make a difference. And so it remains to be seen how much they'll change and how much people are just dying to get together again and the travel will explode again. It's a good question. The other question is this, is this idea of building back better. You're seeing that emphasis in the EU, in the United States that as we put money in the economy to recover from COVID, to rebuild our infrastructure, do we focus those investments on fit for the future investments, um, building renewable energy, building resilient infrastructure, building the kinds of things that we're gonna need in a zero carbon world, or do we look to the past? And that is gonna vary in different jurisdictions, but the degree to which we do that will help to determine whether, I mean, COVID was terrible for people. Let's not, let's just, let's admit that and put it aside, but whether COVID helped us on the climate or ended up being neutral to harmful. 
Um, we did see a lot fewer emissions last year and that's helpful, but the question is where they go this year and next year um, and whether they're on a slightly different trajectory or whether they go right back to the trajectory that came before. In past recessions, they have. They've gone right, right. back to the previous trajectory, but maybe this one is different. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, benefits of my job is I spend a lot of time talking to people in, in the business world. And one thing that they are all um, agreed upon is that business travel is not going to bounce back. Um, it, it will bounce back, but not anywhere near the level that uh, it had been before. And that certainly uh, will make a, uh, a difference. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the issue that you raised about the German constitutional courts ruling on intergenerational equity is completely fascinating. Does anyone, and I know you're not an international lawyer, but does anyone think that there's going to be a knock-on effect and that other uh, countries will follow this path? That, yep. Yeah, I, I don't <clears throat> think, you haven't seen any other cases like this yet. This is just completely new ground. Um, I don't know how other courts might rule, but I do think you'll see other cases like this brought and testing this concept. And then the question is, does the law in those jurisdictions support a ruling like that that you saw in Germany? Um, and that, that is a very open question. And I think many, many people are thinking about the implications of this and how it might play out. But I think it will almost certainly be tested in different jurisdictions. And then the question is, how do the courts rule yeah. and how does local law support it? <clears throat> Am I uh, imagining things or haven't there been cases filed in U.S. courts that have made similar arguments? I don't think they've gone anywhere, but I do think that that same uh, intergenerational equity argument has been, has been presented in court. Yeah, there was the youth climate case here in the United States, and it didn't have it, it. It wasn't particularly successful. And the reason why is that U.S. law is quite different than German law, and there wasn't as clear. I mean, the, it, it, this was a new interpretation of German law, and there wasn't really a segment of American law that lent itself to being interpreted that way. So um, I think we're getting uh, close to. Uh, the end of the road here. And I really just want to come back to the um, your observations on the dialogue between Germans and Americans on, um, on these issues. Um, uh, do you think that there is a general uh, understanding uh, of the two sides approach or is or are we seeing some friction on this and how you how you get to zero? Is still a bit of friction, frankly. And I'll just draw on my own example. When I was in Berlin, I got asked a lot of questions that um, for people who weren't following US politics regularly, that was definitely a bit of a misunderstanding of what the Biden election meant. I got a lot of, you're going to be Europe now, you're going to have a carbon price, you're going to look just like us. And we're not. Um, our politics are different, our ways of thinking are different, in some ways good and in some ways bad. And so I think we need a better understanding of each other. I think Americans sometimes take the German point of view as being somewhat holier than thou. And the Germans look at the American point of view and um, <clears throat> don't necessarily understand our, understand our pragmatism as, as less a source of advantage and more of a challenge and can't really understand why we don't think like they do. So, we're talking past each other a little bit. And um, that's why I think talks like this are useful. We both, have, we both have good qualities. We're both doing good things. We're taking different mechanisms. We can learn from the attitudes and experiences of each other and focus on that rather than focusing on what we're doing differently and getting too crosswise. But I think we have a ways to go still. Um, I'm sure we have ways to go. So which is one uh, uh, follow up one detail question on that. You know, one of the biggest differences which you pointed out between the German approach and the American approach is the, um, the role of nuclear energy. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I'm curious, you know, in, in, in the United States, the, uh, there was a really interesting evolution where environmentalists for a long period of time 
were for the most part uh, powerfully anti-nuclear uh, because they were focused on the issues of waste and the possibility of accidents. Um, today, most environmentalists will say, uh, yeah, I'm sort of holding my nose, but nuclear has to be part of the solution. Uh, and uh, let's face it, 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 it's expensive. We don't want accidents, but it's clean. Um, when uh, uh, German climate experts talk to American climate experts, um, what kind of appreciation do they have for America's position on nuclear? Because in Germany, you know, nuclear has this special taboo for all kinds of complicated cultural reasons we could go through. Um, and um, uh, I guess the question is when Germans look at the world, what do they think about nuclear? We know what they think about nuclear at home. That's a really difficult question. I mean, I certainly heard Germans when I was there are making arguments that they, that they didn't want nuclear energy, not just in Germany, but in Europe or they didn't want to bring in any nuclear energy by wire, even if it would help them meet their zero carbon goals. Um, it's difficult for me to get inside the heads of people who are thinking like that. I, I, I understand the concern about nuclear and I share it in many ways. It's a difficult technology. And we can say, we're going to make this plan as, plan as safe as possible. But like when you look at what happened at Fukushima and you're like, okay, you built a nuclear plant in an area prone to tsunamis and you put the, the backup pumps in the basement. Who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> you know, those plants were built right. and they were built in a country with a strong nuclear program. And so I understand the reticence. And I think, and I think you see a lot of, um, particularly environmentalists in the US, some are opposed to nuclear and others are, as you described, holding their nose. Um, and I think it's because they don't see nuclear as, as amazing. It's because they see the alternative as worse. And that attitude has flipped in Germany. So it's not that we're tremendously different. It's not that Americans love nu nuclear and want it everywhere. But I think it's this idea of we view the lesser evil differently. Right. Well, this has been uh, completely fascinating. And uh, it, it's going to be a set of subjects that we continue to come back to uh, at the academy. And we know that uh, you, Samantha, are coming back to Germany uh, with some regularity, we hope, and that um, we can re-engage and check in on these issues because um, in the discourse across the Atlantic, uh, climate is taking an ever larger uh, role or more of the bandwidth and uh, appropriately so. So it was great to have you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I want to thank our uh, audience as well. Uh, thanks for your participation. Thanks for your questions. Um, we hope we will see you again. Um, we have one more event in our spring semester at the Academy, uh, and it will be online. It is going to be on uh, Monday, July 5th. This will be our Lisa and Heinrich Arnold lecture uh, with uh, former Academy fellow Liliana Weisberg. Uh, it has a German title, unusually, Schreiben von Unterwegs, Postkarten von Walter Benjamin. Uh, in other words, uh, notes, from, uh, notes from the road might be one way to uh, translate that, postcards from Walter Benjamin. And I very much hope you can join us for that. And uh, I wish you all well. And again, Samantha, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. <laughs>